right. Good morning, everybody. This is General Housing and Military Affairs of the Vermont General Assembly House of Representatives. And this morning, this morning's agenda is posted on our website. Uh, we have with us uh, the folks that helped us stand up the um, rental assistance and arrearage program, the, the eviction moratorium program. Actually, actually, those folks aren't here today. Um, this is this is about H nine sixty six. So we have more columns from VHFA, Richard Williams from the State Housing Authority, and Jen Holler and Gus Selig from BHCB. Um, I would like to start today um, simply by welcoming them and by um, sharing my gratitude to them for um, really as long as we've been working on this working on a program that gets us to where we are um standing up a program or a number of programs of this size uh, is very difficult to do under normal circumstances and certainly as we continue under the pandemic these are abnormal circumstances and um, while we worked with speed i'm sure we did not hit all of our marks and i hope to um the hear from the folks uh, where we didn't so that we can improve that what we did but i do want to take the opportunity to thank them and to really thank us as well for you know but but to thank them for executing what has been able to get done so far it really truly is um, unique in at least my experience here in the building and um i think a number of people have have related to me on the positive side that there's you know that this is gives us a lot more hope than we had a year ago in terms of working under these circumstances and trying in the case of homelessness trying to um, minimize it as much as possible that said it's not without it's um there is improvement to be made and I suspect by the end of the by the end of this session today that we'll have a pretty good idea of what we would need to consider in the coming weeks. So um, with that, I think I will. Um, I'd like to actually. I don't know what the agenda says. I don't have it in front of me, but um, I'd like to start with Richard, and if that's okay, and then go to VHCB and then to VHFA um, to. Um, to just do a, a review of what's been able to get done, kind of give us a standing of, of the process, and then certainly give us a standing of what the financial situation is with each of these programs and what the forecast is. Um, I think I wanted to start with Richard because in one respect, um, the true level of the crisis may not be known yet. Um, September 1st is, first, is among us, and that'll be kind of the first big month without um, where unemployed people are not able to um, have the $600 that would help them with their rent. So 600 weekly. Um, so Richard, welcome. Um, and uh, the microphone is yours. Good morning. Uh, it's good to see all the, the representatives and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Richard Williams. I'm the executive director of the Vermont State Housing Authority. Uh, I'm sorry you folks are having to spend your August and September in, in, in Zoom land here. Um, Zoom peel, I think it was somebody's coined a phrase, Zoom peelier. Oh, there you go. That's a good one. I'm gonna write that one down. Uh, you know, for us folks that are testifying, this is about as convenient as you can make it for us. You know, we're not running over to the state house and, uh, you know, standing out in your hallway. <laughs> waiting to get in. So uh, uh, it's, I know it's inconvenient for you folks. Uh, and I know that it's, it's not like being in the same room where you can actually read emotions and body language and, uh, and see who's in the room around you watching you. You know, I, I look at the YouTube and I see there's a lot of folks that are, are following this. So, uh, so I, I actually do think it has opened up and uh, made the process transparent. But those are just my personal thoughts. So just to give you a quick history, um, as you know, it's uh, Bill H-966. Uh, it was related to the COVID-19 funding and it was assistance for broadband, connectivity, housing, economic and relief. And that was uh, signed into law by Governor Scott on July 2nd. The Vermont State Housing Authority launched on Monday, July 13th, the Rental Housing Stabilization Program uh, just as a reminder, the program fund, uh, funds 
landlords on behalf of tenants in need of rent arrearage uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the program, and uh, use the acronym going forward, uh, we named it the Rental Housing Stabilization Program. So I'm gonna use the RHSP. Uh, we'll provide a rental arrearage to the landlord for the actual amount owed by the tenant or up to the VSHA payment standard, whichever is less per single household if the unit meets eligibility criteria. The primary goal, just to uh, keep in mind of this program is to keep Vermonters housed during this public health emergency by allowing them to keep their rented homes, by granting back rent funds and avoiding terminations of tenancy, court evictions and homelessness. The secondary goal uh, that some uh, folks uh, seem to forget. It's also to compensate landlords for some of their losses due to the CARES Act, you know, the judicial emergencies, stay of evictions proceedings. Um, you know, since the, uh, the governor's emergency order went into effect in March 16th, I think it is. And then with the passage of S333, which extended a moratorium on evictions for non-payment rent uh, and such uh, for 30 days past the emergency order. So Governor Scott, you know, extended the emergency order to September 15th. So now it is October 15th, uh, assuming that the, um, the emergency order is not continued, which uh, I expect it probably will continue. And uh, so as of currently, uh, these cases cannot get into the judicial system. So it's, this has been a little controversy, but the applications are currently processed on a first come first served basis. And uh, that, that's stirred up a lot of activity in the beginning because uh, people thought we were gonna run out of money quickly. Uh, that's not the case. And finally, the units have to be occupied and free from life safety hazards. The RHSP has been active for six weeks and has paid out uh, $2.1 million in back rent assistance. So that's over $70,000 per day or $350,000 per week to 816 Vermont households. It's reaching every county in the state. It's highlighted a tremendous need in our state uh, with the stream of applications. Uh, the first few weeks, it was just um, nothing crashed. Fortunately, we were able to keep our call center up and uh, respond timely. But uh, I think the first day we had 500 or, you know, uh, by the uh, end of the third day, I think we we're close to you know, 1500 applications. There's, there's been some challenges uh, because of the way the program was designed that the uh, tenant could submit a, a request and the landlord could re uh, submit a request. And there were reasons behind that. Um, and it's, you know, regarding, uh, you know, I would call it quality control. Uh, you know, sometimes parties don't report the same information and it's sort of a check and balance uh, when you have the landlord and you have a tenant saying, you know, how much is owed in, in a rearage. Um, but uh, what that did do is create a lot of extra work for us uh, because we have to, well, we've referred to them as orphan applications because we have the landlord side and we don't have the tenant side or we have the tenant side and we don't have the landlord side. So we, we spend uh, huge amounts of time uh, communicating back and forth uh, uh, trying to get the data that, uh, that we need to process the application. We have deployed the uh, resources of staff, um, you know, and on an extended schedule, including nights and weekends to meet the demand. And we've also implemented, implementing weekly check runs. Uh, as of right now, there's no evidence of declining numbers. Well, the pattern of the applications has proven that many tenants have not been able to pay their rent during the current public health crisis. It has also demonstrated the continued need for affordable housing and shown that the most vulnerable populations were hit the hardest. 
daily inquiries and pleas have come from hardworking Vermonters saying they have used all their reserves to pay rent up to this point, but they are worried about how they will pay rent next month. VSHA is dedicated to the task at hand with the realization that it's necessary public service for the physical, mental, economic health of our communities. And while we are meeting a current need, it's certain that the need will continue. We developed a streamlined application that is almost entirely digital, but remains fluid enough to implement changes and adaptations as needed. Uh, for your information, we meet weekly. Uh, we have a standing meeting every Tuesday afternoon with uh, Commissioner Hanford uh, from Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, Wendy Morgan and her team from Vermont Legal Aid, and Angela Zawkowski from the Vermont Landlords Association, so, and, and our team here at Vermont State Housing Authority. So we continue to make changes and modifications as, as you know, as issues come up. Uh, I think it's a good process. Uh, we, it's our intent to continue that. Uh, out of that is uh, we're going to be standing up some modified applications, hopefully today, uh, with some new FAQs on our website. Uh, it's uh, our process is. Uh, internally here is, uh, is to expedite the review of the applications, but we put a strong emphasis on quality control and we set up this six point process that focuses on accuracy and integrity of each submittal. We've, uh, our outreach has ranged from digital paid ads on front porch to live radio spots around the state. Uh, we're also having some conversations with Vermont Housing Finance Agency uh, looking into the possibility uh, of sending out uh, postcards uh, to everyone in the state. Um, and the Vermont Landlords Association has expressed an interest in, in participating in that if we go forward. Uh, we still plan to continue our radio ads. Uh, we're thinking we're reaching a lot of population here. We've got a good response, you know, from Front Porch, front porch Forum, but you know, a lot of the folks that need our assistance uh, may not be accessing that media. And so we're constantly looking uh, for new ways uh, to get the, the word out. Uh, Angela Zawkowski from Vermont Landlords Association mentioned in testimony yesterday and before the Senate that uh, she was still getting a lot of calls from landlords that, you know, are not familiar with the program. And uh, that's concerning. Uh, so we're going to do another mailing we, uh, to all our landlords that we participate with through our Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. Uh, we probably have over five to 6,000 landlords uh, that we send checks to on a monthly basis. And so we're going to, we, we did that initially, but we're going to do it again. Uh, just letting, you know, I think there was, uh, in, you know, in the beginning, you know, with any government program, there's always skepticism. Uh, but I think the word's getting out that the program is working well. I think the landlords are, uh, uh, you know, a lot of payments have gone out, so that's a good thing. Um, and so from my perspective, my phone's not ringing off the wall from you folks. So that, that means we've either done something right um, or they're not calling you. But because I've only actually had... Uh, two senators and two representatives uh, called me in the last, you know, seven weeks, I guess now, uh, with constituents that needed some help. Not, there was any, not complaints. It was just that, you know, how do you access the program and, and, and such like that. So we've been managing, uh, you know, um, Again, in the beginning, we, you know, we participated you know, in large group video conferences and webinars where our community partners and service agencies. And we maintained this call center with three phone lines for 12 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, and with all our programs, uh, we have interpretive and translation services available upon request. That was, that was quite an issue in the beginning uh, because you know, when we set up the program, we didn't have everything uh, translated at the time. Uh, and, and folks wanted to see that, um, but on the website, it did say that, you know, our services are available. They, they always have been, they always will be. 
because uh, that's the type of programs we are. We need to make those available. Uh, but we have not had any requests, even though that was, uh, you know, that was a big issue in the beginning. Uh, but, uh, and I checked in yesterday and we still have not had any requests for interpretive services uh, from this agency. Now, other agencies are providing that, you know, uh, information as well and services, you know, Vermont Legal Aid is, and uh, the uh, Vermont Landlord Association, if you haven't seen it, did a great video out there. And uh, they're having that, I think, translated into uh, seven different languages. Uh, and uh, so a Angela did a great job on that. Uh, that's up on our website and uh, it may be on others as well. So we're anticipating, you know, with the federal unemployment money cut uh, and then reduced in the month of August, VSHA expects to see an uptick in the number of landlords and tenants applying for the program. It's likely that many of these applications will be new and therefore we'll have lots of questions regarding the application process. And again, that's gonna be an administrative burden to the program uh, at an ele elevated level for the foreseeable future, but that's on us. Our referrals from the partner, from the program to our partner organization, Vermont Legal Aid, have remained at a, uh, I think, lower than expected level, uh, with the majority of those being from landlords with, and I found out that a lot of people don't like this word, but we, uh, it's not my word, but that it began uh, with recalcitrant tenants, um, in, which is under a group two provision on our application. And what that means is the landlord has tried to reach out to the, to the tenant, uh, try to get them to participate in the program, you know, to, to get back rent and either has, um, you know, has ignored, uh, avoids, whatever the reason is, um, is not willing to participate. Uh, part of this program will allow the landlord to get uh, half the arrearages and at the same time, continue the ev eviction process. You know, we talked about this with you folks uh, in depth, so that I, hopefully that doesn't come as any surprise. But the number of those <clears throat> applications, and I will get to the, the data soon, uh, is not great. I think a lot of people were, you know, were concerned that, you know, landlords were gonna take that route and uh, you know, get half half their rearage and continue with the evictions. But as I explained, the process already is that this, you know, the uh, the stay on evictions uh, is. I don't understand why any landlord wouldn't want to get the money, uh, not knowing when they might be able to get into court. Why would they want to try to work out the relationship with the tenant? Most landlords we work with <clears throat> don't want vacancies. They don't want turnovers, especially in a pandemic, you know, where, you know, just getting a contractor to do work has been challenging for, for a lot of landlords. So uh, we work closely with, uh, there's, as I said, there's huge uh, staff time spent going back and forth between tenants and landlords. You know, Legal Aid's doing the same thing. Vermont Landlords Association uh, has reached out to, I think, over 400 landlords. Uh, we're now starting to settle some court cases. Uh, I think if you remember his earlier testimony and way back in May and June, which seems like a year ago, but I know it wasn't. Um, it, it's, um, we've already settled a couple of the cases uh, working through the Vermont Landlords Association. I know uh, Vermont Legal Aid and the Vermont Landlords Association is selling a couple. Uh, it was a challenge. Uh, for Vermont Legal Aid to get access to the court records. And I don't think they get those until uh, pretty late in July. I'm sure that uh, Wendy Morgan will be on to talk before this uh, committee at some point in time and Angela will as well. And they can, uh, and they can uh, talk to you folks about, you know, some of their, their struggles and issues that they ran into. So I guess the most important lesson learned for, for us has been how to adapt on a daily level to the sheer volume of applications and inquiries um, and to meet this demand and continue helping Vermonters in the most efficient and effective way possible. Uh, we're continuing to hire additional staff to cover the call center and the application processing. 
And uh, we've been spending a lot of, on overtime on a daily basis. Um, it's clear the trend's gonna continue um, and the administrative burden to keep the program running successfully will remain high. So currently there's, uh, uh, we've, we've uh, made only a few uh, payments so far. Uh, currently there's a little over $22 million remains in the program for rent or rearage grants. Um, and uh, thought I might just kind of go down some of the um, some of the challenges that we've seen, and uh, some of the program trends and such, and moving forward. So the challenges have been the vol volume of applications um, being incomplete or conflicting applications. The program trends, uh, as I as I mentioned, you know, early on we had some. Uh, larger grant requests. Uh, we're starting to see now requests coming in for, for the month of July, the month of August, and some folks have even started applying for September because they know they just don't have the money to make to pay their September rent. So I think the grant request amounts will be less for, and for less months. Uh, we had thought about, uh, you know, should we hold these claims until the end of the month? you know, but rent is due on payable on the first of the month. Uh, so we're are paying these going forward uh, as they submit them. So program trends, more applications for smaller amounts, uh, applications with more recent time frame. We're now starting to see tenants looking for that first, last and security deposit and possible rental assistance. Uh, Better uh, and the other program trend is you know better community understanding of the program. Moving forward, the uh, uh, I have uh, asked that Vermont Legal Aid and Vermont Landlords Association uh, help us stand up the program uh, for the first month's uh, rent security deposit uh, and possible some rental assistance through uh, through the through December. We've also uh, added a, uh, a question to our application form uh, for landlords asking if they need uh, a small grant or loan uh, to uh, be able to turn over their apartment, uh, to be able to reoccupy their apartment, to rent their apartment. Is we want to refer those to the rental recovery program or the rental rehab, uh, uh, which is uh, Commissioner Hanford stood up with the home ownerships, the five home ownership centers here in Vermont. So we want to be able to make those referrals uh, to that program as well uh, for any units that have life safety or, or extensive maintenance issues. So just to look at a couple numbers. Um, so this program has been active for six weeks. As I said, we paid out a little over $2.1 million. And um, our next check run is September 4th. Um, as of yesterday, there's $1.2 million uh, ready to, to go out the door uh, next week. That, that may be actually higher, uh, but that's, that's what is in the queue and uh, loaded up uh, for direct deposits uh, for September 4th. Um, household served to date is, uh, it sounds like a small amount, it's 816 households. Our next check run though is for 710 households. So you can see it's ramping up. So total served by September 4th will be uh, 1,348 households. As I mentioned, we are reaching every county in the state. Um, in those first uh, check runs, uh, group one, which is, that's for the, uh, those are for landlords that have not received the full monthly rent uh, for the tenant. And they, are, they have agreed to um, stop eviction and not to raise rents. Uh, there was 703 in that group and this group two, which is what I referred to as a recalcitrant uh, tenant, 
those landlords are willing to accept half of the past due rent. Uh, there was 113 uh, households there. The number of individual tenants for Group One was uh, was 1,734, um, and with Group Two, it's, so it's about 2,000 tenants uh, there. Group One, the uh, the average uh, dispersed per household is around $2,600, and Group Two was $2,100. The amount of grant funds dispersed per tenant was Group One was a little over $1,000. Average number of months of a rearage were four months. Um, so the total program payments earmarked uh, by September 4th will be around almost $6 million. Uh, and that's taking into consideration there's, uh, I think there's 970 incomplete applications we have right now. So we took that as an average and that's how we came, came up to that number. So we're um, in, uh, I was asked this question in the Senate, you know, everybody's wondering, you know, are we gonna use this money? Uh, and we're all asking the same question and monitoring it closely. But if we do the extensions on based on you know, the way this is performing in the first six or seven weeks, we think we're going to have a total program payout uh, of around $19 million. And uh, so I also uh, sent over to Ron was uh, a breakout by, uh, by counties, the arrearages, the grants. Uh, so folks can, can take a look at that. Um, there was a couple things I did want to go over with you that came up in the Senate yesterday. Um, there's concerns about that we're not means testing. That means that we're not verifying income household. Um, uh, we had a lot of conversations about that in this committee and there's good reasons why we didn't do that. First of all, it would slow this program down. Um, second of all, the concern is that, you know, somebody that might be paying uh, $3,000 in rent, might be able to be able to afford $2,000 in rent and submitting a claim to us for $1,000. So I just remind him that this is a, you know, there, there are folks who would, had good jobs, you know, that might have worked for dealer.com or grocery.com or whatever, they lost their jobs and they're trying to maintain households. So I think the, the conversations that we had in the beginning, and, and I think they're still good, is that uh, everybody's looking for some help. Uh, we haven't seen the demand that we thought we were going to. We thought we were going to see huge demands. So um, what that tells me is, you know, Vermonters are trying to pay the bills, you know. But I think in the next few months, we're going to see uh, a lot more coming in, smaller amounts, but more people applying. Uh, I am very concerned if we, uh, if, um, if anything changes and that we have to do means testing, uh, because, you know, we run a section eight housing choice voucher program and, you know, it is very time consuming to verify income because, of, you know, especially if you're doing third party income verifications, uh, we'll never get, we'll never get the money out the door. And that means that landlords won't get money and tenants won't get it. And, uh, so I'm hoping we don't go down that. <clears throat> the other, uh, the other thing that came up yesterday is, you know, if you look at, uh, you know, in the bill, there was a section and it talked about for tenants and unsustainable tenancies and households that received emergency housing benefits from the Department for Children and Family General Assistance. That's where the uh, allows us to, uh, uh, you know. Um, what well, the intent was, that's where we could be using our first month, last month, security deposit and possible rental assistance. There was some concern raised about that because they thought that was going to be for only for DCF. But there's a word in there that says, and households. You know, so it talks about unsustainable tenancies. There's a lot of people that are outside the DCF system or the agency of human system that are living in 
a situation and they need to move to a, another apartment. You know, uh, it's we've seen a few of those come through where people are paying higher rent. They have an opportunity to move into, you know, maybe a maybe a, a, a you know a subsidized development or you know, affordable housing uh, unit that, you know, has been produced through the tax credit program or through funding through VHCB uh, where their rent would go down, but they need help. They need that first month's rent security deposit to be able to move that. So with this program, we can help those landlords, first of all, that there's moving out of, you know, because we can help the landlord, you know, get some of their rent arrearage back. And at the same time, we can get some people into some, get tenants into new, more affordable housing. Um, I'm just telling you, I just wanted you to be aware of it. It came up. Um, and the other, th you know, the other, uh, we're really hoping that, uh, you know, at the national level that this, you know, the uh, CRF funds, you know, uh, time frame for spending is extended because, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's going to be, uh, I don't see things changing quickly here, you know, in the next few months. So, uh, first of all, it would give us more time to spend money and, and for a longer period of time, uh, uh, to help people out. So I don't know what, what's going to happen there. Um, but you know, everybody that's trying to run any type of CR, you know, program or under the same, you know, the same pressure is, uh, it's, uh, it was a, a short time to stand up a program. Um, and it's a short time to spend the money. So. So Richard, we have a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, I appreciate that, that update. Um, it is the, there is a huge amount of frustration with the federal situation without knowing, um, you know, the Senate went away for their break without, uh, solving the at least the extension for, uh, issue, never mind the rest of the money. Um, and so, as you said, no one knows uh, what the extension is going to be. And I think in a situation like this, I, I'm ha I'm, I, I'm glad to hear that the program as it's going is estimated to be still within the amount that we've budgeted. But I do think that what we budgeted was. Uh, um, a guesstimate on, um, it, but both the administration and we thought forty million dollars was probably right, or forty-two million dollars probably right, and um, that clearly can be the case if it's extended. I think you know it's going to ramp up too in a lot of the small in, in a lot of the small ways. Um, Representative Triano, you have a question. I do. Um, I also, we all also heard uh, Peter Welch on yesterday talking about how um, he uh, would support an extension of um, uh, uh, the due date on these benefits. And I think we will see some movement in Congress uh, to accommodate that um, since I think states all around the country are coming in with the same issues. Um, the other, the other thing I wanted to comment on is that um, I understand means testing um, as a um, as a problem um, for uh, an agency. When I worked in the courts uh, and they went to a uh, means testing for assignment of a public defender, it turned into a total mess. I mean, trying to get people to bring in W twos or tax returns to uh, establish that it just extended the process. Uh, people weren't being assigned in time. Um, so um, I agree totally with your assessment that that would uh, certainly com complicate things. But my question is um, just curiosity, not taking a position either way, but um, is there a question on the application for tenants um, as to whether or not their inability to pay their rent is directly linked to something to do with the COVID uh, uh, pandemic? You know, uh, represented through the certification that they sign uh, that they're applying for is that they need, you know, this is the reason why they need uh, the money. We are asking the information and we haven't, you know, because of the, because of the uh, number of applications, we haven't had a chance to data input this, but uh, we do have asked a lot of information. Uh, one about the age, 
uh, of the applicant. Uh, the asking if they have a disability, asking if they have, and asking what the annual household income ranges are. You know, so uh, also the race, ethnicity, and you know, is there a limited English proficiency issue in in their gender? So once this data has been inputted, we're going to have a lot of good data, and I think I can. And I, what I want to do is I've asked my staff to, uh, to prioritize going through the uh, payments that we made to, you know, to get this information so I can get back, you know, to the Senate committees as well as, as well as your committee is to, this is who we're serving. And I think I can uh, uh, hopefully alleviate, alleviate any concern that, you know, we're serving people at higher income. You know, very high incomes. So, I, for what we're seeing, that that's not true. But you have, you know, it's until I, I can get this data inputted, I, I can't prove it to you. Well, uh, great, Richard. Thanks for being here today, and thanks for this this update. I have a whole page of notes already, and I'm um, gratified for the job that you're doing. Thank you. So there is a uh, a new part of the program we're going to stand up uh, that hasn't been out there, uh, but will be on the on the website, and it's, we're calling it it's it's under the group two, uh, but we're calling it vacancy loss. Um, this will be for landlords that, you know, applied under group one, and the tenant did not submit an application, or applied under group two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you these applications so you know what what these applications look like and who's group one and who's group two. Uh, so they applied under group two, but the tenant vacated the unit before the, great, before the grant claim was processed and paid, or the tenant vacated the rental unit after March 1st, 2020, owing unpaid rent. And, and if the landlord is able to document the lost rent as a result, we will pay half the amount of the owed for any arrearages incurred after March 1st, going forward. So any arrearages pre-March 1st, we will not reimburse them. But the idea behind this, and we're, we're going to ask him to document this through a copy of their rent ledger. Uh, we're asking the date vacated or the date the landlord became aware of the vacancy and has the unit be re-rented. Re and if so, on what date? And if it's not rented, is the unit in rentable conditions? And those are yes and no's. And then we're gonna, as I mentioned, do you need access to loan or grant monies to re-rent your units? That's a yes or no. Uh, we're asking them to provide tenant contact information of the new address if they know it. And we're also asking them if the case was filed in court and if so, who their attorney was. Um, as I've mentioned, this, this program is two purpose. You know, it's one is to prevent homelessness, but at the same time is to help out landlords that have got no and many have got no revenue since March. So they're paying their bills, they're paying their property taxes, which are, we've all got property tax notices in their mail in the last couple of weeks. So we know they're coming due. And you know, they're paying their utilities. They gotta pay for their water. They gotta pay for the sewer. Some are paying for electricity. And many, and, and some, and a lot of landlords have just not received a dime. So this isn't much, but it's a little, if you give them something, maybe they can turn over this unit, they can make it rentable, we can get somebody into it. So uh, we ran this by Commissioner uh, Hannaford and he ran that by, you know, uh, I guess it's, it's a guidepost, the uh, consultant and, uh, and also with his uh, administration team uh, that's watching every dime closely to make sure that Feds don't come back and you know claw back this money from the state of Vermont. So we're looking at it very closely. And as I as I mentioned, we're we have standing weekly meetings with Commissioner Hanford and folks, and we're constantly looking at this program. Um, so the question is, uh, you know, if there is a surplus, you know, uh, w we've started having those conversations, uh, and. Uh, but I don't think we're ready to have those conversations with you folks probably until maybe into October because you know that's when we're really going to know. Uh, you know, I could see where this money could be transferred. You know, uh, easily to you know to the rental rehab program or Vermont Housing Finance Agency if we're not using it. Uh, the challenge that Commissioner Hanford will have is getting the units back online. 
by the deadline, you know, by the end of December. Uh, so, but they, but I don't know what those uh, applications are looking like that are coming into the home ownership center, but I, I hear that there is, uh, uh, there is a quite the demand for this money. Uh, Cause land we'll land hear from, we'll hear from commissioner Hanford a little bit later right. today. Um, I have one more question for you, Richard, sure. before we have to move to um, VHCB is from representative Gonzalez. Sure. Um, Thank you, Richard, for that overview. And I would be very interested in seeing the application just so that we've got that, that full wrap around. And one, when you were talking about the demographic questions, uh, I have specifically have questions if you are also gathering information on sexual orientation and if gender uh, include is just a, uh, what, what are your gender categories that you're um, uh, collecting? Um, I see what the form says, and it probably should be changed. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's the gender is male and female. So uh, that's a good question, and this hasn't been updated, so we can fix that today. And um, in terms of sexual orientation, do you have that on your application as well? Uh, we, we speak about that, um, you know, as far as, you know, uh, any discrimination uh, based on any of those. Uh, that's another um uh, we think a use of the, the first month, last month security deposit, if there's, you know, someone moves, you know, and it says uh, unsustainable tendencies, it does not just necessarily mean affordability. I mean, if you're, you know, if, you're, if there's a situation of, you know, whatever the situation is, there's other opportunities to, to use this money to get someone out of a, a bad tendency and get them into a safe environment, so. Well, having, I'm glad that that is included in the other pieces. And if we're collecting demographics, then collecting social orient or sexual orientation is um, is a helpful demographic for us to to have as well as we look at the the program overall. I'll take note of that. Thank you for the comment. Thank you, Representative Walls. You have a question? Yes, I do, and I apologize. I've lost connection a couple of times here. And I don't know, maybe this is a question for you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, when do we have to make a decision on whether to repurpose funds? Must be a deadline to put that. The repurposing of, of funds is is ongoing. I think it's, um, there's, the, there, there's a deadline. There's a, as, as this, if 12.30 remains the absolute deadline, there's a stepping back, there's a 12.20 deadline where it might be repurposed um it, there may be check-ins later i think i think the way that it's being set up is that um by next friday appropriations at least the house appropriations and it'll be ongoing till we're done we'll be trying to develop a plan b like what do we do when we're not here after september 25th or whenever our last day is and what if there's money that's available, not specifically money like that. Like if, if, if the, if the account that Richard is talking about shows a balance of $10 million, it's not about taking money from there and repurposing that that's later in the year. That'll be later in the year. If there's like a rush to have to spend money at the end of the year, that might happen. But in terms of if, if there's all of a sudden uh, a run on the money and, and we anticipate the need for more there, the joint fiscal, committee will have to be given the right to make those some of those decisions to move money from this 180 million dollar pot that's that does exist right now but the shifting of it that richard's worried about um i think that's probably later on in the year um when it's it may be clear that the argument can be made that the money can't be spent before the 30th but it can be spent someplace else okay thank you We'd know a lot more if we had an extension. How's that? Um, if, if it would be helpful just to let you know that uh, we got a request uh, from the Senate yesterday that came in from uh, Senator Kitchell to all the, the chairs. And I expect you to probably be happening the same as on the House, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman. But they were uh, they were asking each chair to gather information because uh, as they work through their budget and they were you know, spending the remaining federal um, coronavirus relief funds, uh, they wanna, they're asking about uh, 
the current programs and the funding and how much is being spent and how much is uncommitted and what is expected to be spent. And I'm sure your uh, appropriation uh, committee will be doing the same. Yeah, they're following up. So, well, thank you for that. Um, again, this info, his, Richard's testimony is online on our website. And um, do you have a, another report due to us after we had the August 15th report that's also on our website? Um, I'm not sure if there's a later one. Uh, I uh, just posted the one that uh, this is a, uh, there's no uh, actual formal request for a, uh, you know, report, but I updated the report, uh, which is on your website as of today. Great. Uh, what the Senate asked for, and I will provide the same for you, is as we make, uh, if, if you want it, uh, as we uh, make payments, uh, we will update you on the amount that we're spending. Yes, that would be appropriate. Thank you. We would like to know that ongoing. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate your, your testimony. Have a great day. Um, Thank you, um, and please feel free to stay. Um, there are questions that I don't want to get into right now because they could be another half an hour of discussion about um, elements. You, you touched on some of the elements about means testing, but there's also the elements of, um, uh, we all may have heard from landlords who have tenants who aren't leaving recalcitrant, as you said, um, making claims which I have no reason to doubt where you know, people are still working. How can we get people out or um, with respect to S333? And I think this is something we'll talk about with Angela and Wendy when we call them in next week is um, uh, the notion of eviction processes with people who are destroying property. Um, that seems to be a gap in, um, and then, and then um, the Commissioner Hanford may be able to speak to that later today too as well from what they've heard. But I just want to pop over to Jen and Gus. Um, Jen is here. I don't see Gus. Is he at another meeting? He had to jump off to another meeting. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to go ahead, but I also see that Josh is here now and I'm able to stay until um, 1030. I don't know what the demands on the commissioner's time are, but if you'd like to flip the order and that's okay with you, that's fine with me. Um, and Maura, if you can, if you're tuned in, are you here till 1030? Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Then thank you, Jen. I'll, I will, um, I will have Josh pop in. Um, so thank you. And is Gus going to, is this also a way to give Gus more time to come back or? Um, um, I'm, I'm prepared and had planned to do the presentation. So he'll oh, that's great. in it and add if he can, but but I'm all good whenever the committee is. Perfect, that's great. Um, so yes, thank you for that. Then Josh, let's, uh, Commissioner Hanford, let's go to you. Um, I think that there's a generalist testimony for you, but also the landlord uh, rehab rehabilitation program came out of your shop. And um, I know as of recently as two weeks ago that it was almost ready to go, but I'm not sure where it is now. And if you could give us a, um, you know, the feedback on, on that program. And you've also expressed concerns to me about the um, uh, elements of S333, which may have to be tweaked um, with respect to property damage as a reason for eviction. I know we'll hear from um, from Angela and Wendy on this later as well, but I think that's, I've gotten emails from people who can't, who can't get tenants out and they're destroying property and, and which is a fairly normal circumstance with the exception of the fact that we have an eviction moratorium now. Um, so if you could just relay what you have for us, that would be great. Sure, well, um, good morning. Um, Everyone, and for the record, uh, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. And I have time this morning, so if any of the other witnesses have constraints, I'm, I'm happy to go last. I, I not needed till 11.30 over in the Senate, so anyone feel free to jump in. If you have to um, get out of here early, I can pause or go after them. So one, one more so, chance. Right, so Maura and Jen, if you, find, and if you find that you need to go, just send me a chat, um, send me a note in the chat box, and, and I'll... Uh, I'll mute the commissioner. <laughs> That's tempting. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, thank you, Jen. <laughs> um, well, great. Uh, yeah, so I, that's exactly what I thought, um, Chairman. I would kind of give an overview and then jump into progress on the what what's called the rehousing recovery program, the rehab program. Um, you know, first of all, you know, I kind of want to step back and remember the flurry that we were going through in May and June and um, talk about how this all ended up and that the Department of Housing and Community Development was sort of uh, tasked with um, distributing $36.5 million. Um, you know, we had, in your committee had talked about direct appropriations to the groups that, you know, we'd worked so hard and collaboratively with to speed up the process and make direct appropriations to VHFA, Vermont State Housing Authority, Legal Aid and Landlords Association, you know, sort of in the 11th hour and, and Senate appropriations, that all changed and, and those uh, direct appropriations were put to the department to um, make those uh, grant agreements and, and, and stand up those programs, um, essentially, you know, uh, get the project, get the program in place and um, grant agreements with our partners to stand them up. So soon as this um, act was signed into law, July 2nd, um, we started working on that uh, process immediately, you know, day and night, seven days a week. Um, and I think it was pretty extraordinary that uh, 10 days, less than 10 days later, we were able to announce the mortgage assistance program and the rental assistance program, you know, with the governor, um, with grant agreements um, um, in, in place um, in 10 days with these, with this being two of the very first uh, CRF um, sub-grant agreements directly to another entity to make further um, grants to, you know, private individuals in the, in the state um, and landlords and homeowners. That was, you know, one of the first, these were one of the first programs reviewed and for eligibility, you know, concerns for clawback provisions, so we had a lot of work to do um, to get these grant agreements approved and signed um, and in place so that these programs could start accepting applications, you know, like I said, in, in 10 days after signage. Um, so that was a tremendous effort. Um, what we actually did first, the actual first agree, uh, grant agreement and, and partnership we worked on was with the Vermont Landlords Association, because we knew that we needed technical assistance in place before um, these programs could be successful. So people had a place to call. And so that was actually the first grant agreement we worked on um, and had out the door with Angela's group um, very shortly after um, you know, signage of the bill. Um, and then we jumped into the mortgage assistance and rental assistance program. And you know, even after we had grant agreements in place on those, um, and started accepting applications, we had a few hurdles we needed to work through, um, very important hurdles um, to sort of expand the eligibility and meet the intent of the bill. What happened on the um, uh, rental assistance side, and Richard touched on this, I'm sure, a little bit, um, and you certainly, uh, Chairman Stevens, know what, what, what the challenge was, that, that prior to March 1st, um, you know, rental arrearage situations had been flagged by the consultants hired by the state guidehouse as a, um, a flag for potential clawback of these federal funds because it was outside the period of, you know, the pandemic impact. Um, but, you know, we had planned in the legislation to go before that because the point was, if they were um, not paying the rent pre-March 1st and were in an eviction situation, they were going to be enforced into eviction homelessness during the pandemic. And, you know, we, um, you know, our attorney, department attorney wrote a legal opinion that this was, you know, the intent and this was eligible. Legal aid did. Um, the administration was very uh, strongly supportive of the, the goal of this and, um, we reached out to the you know legislature, Senator Sorokin and, and, and you, um, Chairman Stevens, to get some sort of uh, opinion or you know um, you know letter regarding that that's the intent of the legislature. So we all were on record 
that we understood this risk, but we believe that there was a uh, valid and it was appropriate because the result, whether someone was a year um, in a rental rearages or not, or, or it was just during the pandemic, the result would be the same. They'd be thrust into homelessness during the pandemic and that was the whole intent. And so we worked you know, really hard to get that approved so it didn't upset the program. You know, We could have been in a situation where Vermont City Housing Authority had to essentially stop the program and retool it and deny a whole bunch of applications if we didn't get the sign off on that. So we were successful in that. Then we had a, a challenge, which more will probably get into way more detail with um, um, property taxes that if you were not paying your property taxes, you could also lose your home and enter foreclosure. And tax sales are still going on in communities for people not paying the property taxes. And so, you know, we were able to um, get that approved as well. You know, if their mortgage, if their property taxes were included in escrow in their mortgage payment, we sort of already had that sign off. Um, you know, there's a general uh, treasury guidance that says you cannot use these funds to pay, um, you know, government, um, you know, t taxes, essentially uh, property taxes being one of them. But then there's a very clear frequently asked questions that says, except if it will result, it result in a foreclosure of your home. And we had a couple situations um, that came up where there was folks that struggling because uh, their revenue was down on furlough and they were doing their they were paying their mortgage but they weren't paying the property tax and their property tax wasn't escrowed and you know that was a very real situation that we were able to uh, work quickly and get approval and sign off from agency administration and guide house as well on that um and so you know what what we did really in in the speed of state government to get these programs launched and get grant agreements in place uh, was something like I've never seen. Um, and you know what we did internally, the program, the the rehousing recovery program, was sort of put the launch of that um, sort of back burner to get this money out to our partners and launch those programs first. That being said, um, I'll, I'll jump into the update on this program because we have made great progress and I think there's some um, incredible stuff going on in this regard. And I did send a little update to um, Mark, uh, no, uh, Ron. Um, uh, so there is on, on your, your webpage a little report for this rehab program that I'm gonna walk through. Um, you know, it, it's not a very fancy report. Um, you know, I have to remind folks all the time, we, our entire housing division is two people, um, in the whole department. So, um, it, it's pretty crude, but I, I threw it together to give you a sense and, and remind folks of, of what this program was about. Um, so there was 6.2 million assi of CRF money assigned to this rehousing recovery program, which is, uh, the rehab of, of rental properties that were vacant, abandoned, or serious code violations. We put out a um, letter of, of intent or slash NOFA um, as soon as we could after those other grant agreements were, were out the door. And we received seven applications. Um, we selected five. Two of them weren't really um, legitimate a, 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 in, our, in our view. Um, the five that we selected um, and moved forward with uh, grant agreements on were with the five home ownership centers, uh, Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust, Neighbor Works of Western Vermont, Down Street Housing and Community Development, Champlain Housing Trust, and Rural Edge. Um, the uh, program in, in working through, because this is a much uh, more complicated program, you know, we had to work out not only our grant agreements to each of these home ownership centers, but how each of their programs was going to roll out, how their grant agreements were going to look, how they were going to monitor the landlord, set up, you know, payment standards, eligibility requirements. We have a, a five-year ho affordable housing covenant on every single one of these properties going. We had to work through all of that stuff before we could even issue these grant agreements. But these grant agreements are issued. They represent, um, I can, uh, either throw up on my screen or just read through this. Um, so Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust applied for $937,000 uh, 
for 25 units. NeighborWorks of Western Vermont applied for to stand up 45 units at a cost of um, you know close to 1.7 million. Downstreet, um, 20 units at 750,000. Champlain Housing Trust, 20 units at 750,000. And Rural Edge at 20 units for 750,000. So we have a total of 130 units um, being rehabbed, new units being rehabbed and available to folks um, at a, a cost of just under 4.9 million um, is what we have. Um, so we have a, a little bit of money left on the table. Um, and I think that's a good thing at this point because some of these projects you could, they have tremendous demand for, from landlords seeking these funds. That's not the issue. The issue is timing. Can we get it done? Can we get them all complete and folks moved in by December 20th? That's, that's what's in the grant agreements. That's what the landlords are signing up for. They're signing up for also uh, you know, their own private match of 10%, a five-year affordability covenant. Um, and you know, a couple um, requests have already been made for program expansion that we're, we're mainly putting on hold till we see how this goes. Um, one of the elements that is in the, the bill um, and is eligible is for occupied units that have serious code violations are eligible for this program. That was a, a request to, uh, of legal aid, you know, knowing that folks that are living in non-code compliant units technically shouldn't be living there and they could be out on the street as well. But with AHS's coordination, because we, we had many coordinating meetings with AHS and their intent is to, you know, rehouse, um, you know, folks living in motels and hotels that are homeless into these units, they were not supportive of that being a large percentage of these rehabs. So we agreed on a max of 10% of the units at each of these organizations falling onto that uh, occupied but non-code compliant so that the majority of these units are gonna be net new availability. We also have heard from several organizations about um, great, sorry, um, great opportunities for um, a, a unique sort of replacing existing 1960s, 70s area mobile homes that are rental units. That's what people are renting. Some of these are on farm situations where you're talking, you know, migrant farm workers living in them um, that, you know, these owners would swap out these units for this $30,000. They would you know, pay the extra $90,000 and buy a, you know, a net zero or energy star mobile home, agree to affordable rents for five years, um, house their folks in a much safer environment, um, you know, save energy. But that's sort of outside of the original scope because that is a, you know, a purchase and acquisition. And um, so that's on hold as something that maybe um, we look at down the road, as well as sort of new unit creation, um, sort of, if you can imagine, you know, some folks looked at this program and said, oh, geez, well, I can create an ADU. I can, you know, turn um, uh, an a, a existing part of my uh, multifamily um, property into another unit. Um, that also wasn't really the intent of this program, but it's a great use to bring new units online. So currently those two factors we have on hold as something that um, we may consider down the road. Um, so it's, it's good that we have a little bit of, you know, about uh, one and a half million dollars that we can allocate for more um, currently eligible units or to expand this program or, you know, move it to a different um, use. You know, I, I've talked to to, to Gus uh, about a couple projects in, in Rutland that they're, they're, they're similar in nature, that there um, are um, existing rental properties that, you know, sort of sought the VHCB funding, but maybe would fit more into this. And so we're gonna keep, the, the goal is to spend every dime of this on new housing for folks that need it. And, and that's what we're gonna do but we're gonna be flexible about um, some of this remaining funding and, and how we can uh, use it. Um, you know, I, I, on my report, I, I did uh, put the, 
the elements of our grant agreement with each homeownership center in this report so you can see the, the how this program is rolling out you know that this is that you know the goal of this is um to provide uh, financial assistance to uh, vermont landlords these have to be vermont owned landlords to restore blighted vacant and code violating rental units to provide housing for homeless and low-income residents who face an affordable housing shortage as a result of COVID-19 emergency. Um, you know, the homeownership centers will coordinate and make payments on a quarterly, you know, four times to the landlords. They're not gonna give all the money up front. The landlords have to get this work underway and start to front some of this. We're not gonna place all these funds in the hands uh, and then have someone walk away from a project. Um, we're going to have, uh, an, they're, they're have, they have to have an equitable and fair selection process based on um, you know, how quickly they can stand it up, their willingness to serve homeless households. Um, each landlord has to accept at least three um, applications from the continuum of care organization. So three homeless applicants for each unit. Um, from the um, you know intake system and accept the common application from all of the um, continuum of care organizations before they can select a tenant. You know these are their, these are private units, so they the landlord ultimately um, gets to accept a tenant that that works. You know they have to prove that they can pay the rent and that they, but they have to uh, accept at least three. Um, applications from um, the continuum of care organizations um, before they can select a tenant. That was what um, we worked with AHS and homeownership centers as a process to prioritize folks coming out of homelessness first. Um, you know, it's a 30, up to $30,000 per unit maximum grant with a 10% match from the, the owner. Um, they have to ensure all permits and um, uh, rental housing health and safety code is, is, is followed. Um, they um, have to agree to the, uh, what I mentioned, the housing affordability covenant, um, agree to uh, affordable rents for five years, at least five years, and that that transfers to anyone that they sell this to or any other subsequent owners. Um, it means in effect, we can verify that each year by the, um, ran, land, um, the landlord certificate that they have to file with tax on each of these units. And we will be monitoring it for all five years to verify what they're charging as rent and what the um, individual is receiving as any sort of um, rental um, assistance via that uh, rental assistance. Uh, rebate program. Um, so we have a, you know, a lock tight system for verification for the whole five years because um, we'll know who the landlords are and we'll know that they need to file their landlord certificate each year and we'll get a copy of that. Um, and that no, any one owner, property owner will receive more than 15 you know, can it, we can assist more than 15 units with any one property owner. So those are sort of the, the basic elements of the um, program. Um, each of the five homeownership centers are working with landlords right now. Um, they continue to receive calls, you know, about new opportunities. But, you know, the requirements are that this work is done and a lease is signed by December 20th. So, you know, we don't have any signed leases right now. We don't have any completed units, but I think it's the same situation that any of the other, um, you know, housing uh, capital, uh, you know, projects are in. We have agreements, we have projects underway, but nothing's finished. Um, the question that was answered earlier to Richard about sort of how do we um, move money around if we need to, you know, where we didn't have a crystal ball, we made, the best decisions we could on how much money was needed for each of these four programs that's under DHCD's sort of um, authority. We had to issue grant agreements for all of these and, and have to be, uh, you know, sort of responsible for uh, monitoring the funding. The first opportunity to move money around and reallocate it is September 15th. That's what's in the legislation that, you know, technically 
I have the you know authority to move money around. Um, at this point, right now, today, there's no recommendation to move money uh, amongst any of these programs. It's just too early. You know, some of these are you know barely seeing the um, the, the 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 need which we think will continue to grow. Um, but I think all of us we meet you know regularly between the different programs you know, want to see every dime spent on housing. And, and it, it's not about this program being more successful to that than this other program. It's about putting the money where it goes. So we'll continue those weekly check-ins. And, you know, I'm not sure exactly, you know, um, how um, a recommendation to move money will flow once the, you know, you, you guys have adjourned. Um, but I imagine there'll be a process to update you or, or um, you know, emergency e board or joint fiscal or, or someone um, if, if in fact we will be moving money between these programs. Um, so I, I can stop there and see what questions um, you have for any of the programs and the rehab program in particular. Sure. Let's go to Representative Triano and um, and be mindful of time. Actually, I'd just like to limit the questions to the end um, after we hear from Jen and Mora. But I thank you, Commissioner, so far. With the, I mean, it's good to see the subscription rate as high as it is, um, and that it. But I totally appreciate how difficult it was to get this going. Um, you know, but uh, Representative Triano. Uh, yes, just uh, briefly, uh, Josh, um, you say that there are a number of projects in progress. Um, have these landlords uh, or participants had uh, difficulty finding contractors to do this work? You know that? Um, many of the, the landlords doing this work, you know, they kind of have some of their own crews. You know, these are apartments. So, but, but yes, but there are challenges finding um, folks to do all this work. And that's one of the there's one stipulation sort of in this CRF funding that exists right now that if there are supply chain shortages, including labor shortages, that there is a possibility of extension beyond the December 30th date in the existing CRF funding if you can prove one of those situations exists. So we're all exploring that and, you know, are seeking guidance from Guidehouse and others of, you know, what does that mean? How can we, so we're, we're asking our partners to collect that information and every one of the landlords, you know, document their challenges. Cause if we don't get an extension from Congress, um, there is something built into this that allows some sort of request to extend the use of these funds on those two sort of situations, if it can be documented and approved at the, you know, uh, Treasury, U.S. Treasury. So, um, you know, I don't want to say we want that to, to find that, but it, it is a, a, some sort of a relief valve that um, we're, 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 we're going to do our best to document if needed. And just uh, one other um Will there be a method to a referral method to uh, for people who may be interested in moving into these uh, apartments that uh, first, last, and security uh, a referral to uh, get some assistance on that for people who might need it? Right. So you know, there's not only a referral from all the continuum of care organizations to work with their clients to submit applications and 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 they they need to be accepted in these units, but there's also as I believe Richard talked about, um, not only his funding, but some of the funding from AHS that can provide some short-term rental assistance. You know, we can't extend the CRF rental assistance past December. So um, trying to coordinate that, you know, where it works best, like you said, first, last security deposit, um, you know, is one situation we just, you know, we don't have these nearly ready to have these units, um, uh, you know, to start uh, using those resources, but it could become very uh, important. Very good, thank you.
Muted, Tom. Thank you. Um, sorry, my dog. Louder. From uh, Gus. Excuse me, Chair, your sound is cutting out and we're not able to hear you very well. It sounds like he wants us to go ahead, and I wonder if Ron could go ahead and pull up the VHD presentation. I'm going to start. Okay, I'm uh, pulling it up sorry, now Mike. and I'll share screen. Thank you, Ron. Yep. I guess I'll probably jump on in a few minutes too. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jen Holler. I'm the policy director with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, and so we'll be updating you today on um, the capital element of the coronavirus relief fund programs that you um, that you approved. And some of you participated in the um, House Appropriations Committee meeting earlier this week. So you've got sort of the high level overview um, but I'll be able to talk about it in a, a little bit more detail and, uh, and then also, of course, be available for questions. I want to start with um, uh, a thank you and appreciation also for the confidence um, and support that you've given VHCB to play this role during the COVID response. Um, and I also would really like to um, just acknowledge and express a little bit of awe for what Uh, our colleagues adding up all these uh, programs, it's really, it's really pretty incredible. And I almost wonder if it's un unprecedented in, um, in um, an unprecedented um, effort in state government in, over the last few decades. I really think it might be. Um, so let's see, Ron, the, um, um, yes, that slide would be great. So just as a, um, to sort of kind of orient us, um, the you actually provided funding to VHCB um, in two different acts. The first was in the fast track bill um, S350 that was passed pretty early on in the um, in June, and that appropriated twenty three million dollars. Subsequently, you um, added to that amount in H966, the bill in which you um, funded a variety of different housing um, programs with CRF funds and that amount was for $9 million bringing the total to $32 million is the program that we're administering. And the purpose and the language in each bill is actually the same, which has been very, very helpful because at that time, as Josh and others have said, we couldn't exactly predict what the needs were gonna be and what kinds of categories. Um, so the language is the same. And so that's allowed us to respond to proposals that have come into us for both creating um, uh, securing and rehabbing new housing um, to uh, help transition people who are in motels or shelters or experiencing COVID-related homelessness to permanent housing, and then also to make improvements to emergency shelters uh, to make them safer, comply with CDC um, and uh, public health guidelines, as well as expand their capacity because to allow for greater social distancing and just keeping people um, healthier. And we can go on to the next slide. So the first act, um, S350, actually directed, specifically directed VHCB to adopt guidelines and procedures, which is something we would do anyway. Um, but we did that, the board adopted them, and um, officially embedded, uh, a pro created a program and, and uh, guidelines process for using CRF our housing capital um, so to, to, to buy and th fix things. <laughs> um, that's, that's really what uh, our program is designed to do and for two essential purposes that I just kind of referenced. Um, our um, projections and, and goals were to help secure and rehab housing for 150 to 200 households. Um, and the 
um, you'll recall that the CRF funding um, is really designed to uh, address, address COVID uh, related needs and expenses that are, are necessary in order to respond. And uh, so we all know that there's an underlying um, lack of affordable housing. That's why there's homelessness to begin with um, in large part, but there was specific COVID related um, expansion and increase in homelessness. Um, and uh, AHS was seeing higher number of people and housing folks in motels, and there really were not in some areas of the state sufficient units to help rehouse them. So that's what this money was intended to do, to, to um, create more units and access for people to affordable housing in areas where it just didn't exist. And then, the, and then secondarily to help uh, shelters uh, adapt to the new reality and become um, healthier and safer. Our board adopted those, and then we can go on. So when um, you will hear the same thing from us as you do from every everyone, um, that the December 30th deadline is incredibly challenging. Um, so when it um, a typical housing project takes two or three years to bring to fruition. Um, so we knew that uh, we were going to need to move really quickly uh, if this were to have a chance of success. So when it began to look uh, very possible that uh, the legislature would support and the governor would support using funding for this purpose, we went ahead and requested letters of interest from, um, um, from shelter providers and uh, nonprofit housing developers in the areas where there is the highest need. Uh, those were due on June 23rd. It's actually a little bit before I think the law was enacted. We received 56 million in requests. I believe that's information we've shared with you before. Um, our staff reviewed all those requests and invited those that looked like they could meet the CRF um, guidance and guidelines and uh, the deadline were invited to submit full applications by July 20th. Um, we uh, received 29 proposals for $39 million, all the ones that we had invited to apply. Our staff reviewed those, made recommendations to our, uh, our board and the board awarded 30, just a little over 30 million to 26 projects um, on August 6th. So to give you the breakdown kind of between the two bills, the $9 million from Act 137, that was H966, which you, I think, and we are all thinking of is like more focused on the needs of shelters and the need to create expanded capacity there. That's been fully committed. And you can see the details of all this in our full legislative report, which Ron's um, uh, posted on the website. And it actually lists each of the, each of the shelter projects um, that received an award. So if you're interested in that, in that detail, it's there. Of the 23 million from the fast track bill, all but 1.97 um, million is committed to projects. There's more information on that, again, in the, in the full report. I will say that not all the projects are identified because at that time, negotiations were still underway for some of the acquisitions and some are um, for uh, shelters uh, for victims of sexual and domestic violence. And, and so we, we uh, talk about those generally, but not specifically in terms of location. So of the 32, we've got roughly two that's uncommitted. However, we are expecting two more applications in high needs areas. Um, we've seen rough proposals for those, but we've got two more full applications coming in that we anticipate taking to our, uh, our board on September 16th. Those are still um, coming together, but um, based on the information we have, we believe they're gonna request between four and a half and five and a half million. So, what I'd like to um, uh, make clear at this point, though, is that this process is very much, um, well, it's in some ways very similar. We get applications, we review them, we underwrite the projects, we take them to our board, and then they act on those recommendations. That process is all what we always do. What's very different is the compressed timeline. So these projects had to come together very quickly. Um, the scopes of work 
were not completely fleshed out in many instances. Negotiations around the acquisition of the properties weren't necessarily complete. Permitting and environmental assessment and those kinds of things were not as far along as they typically are. So my point in saying all this is that these projects are a little different from what we typically fund. By the time we fund them, they're in very good shape, have a very high likelihood of success and are pretty much ready to go when they pull together all their other funding. With these projects, we're prime, we are the primarily, primary and, and in most instances, the sole source of funding for the projects. And these projects, are it's gonna be challenging for them to meet the December 30th deadline. We funded the ones that we think can meet that deadline, um, but there may be roadblocks in the way and there may be some that don't actually proceed. So we'll be checking in with them on a monthly Actually, they have to uh, report to us officially on a monthly basis, um, but our staff are working with all of them on a weekly basis. And we have, um, we've hired a construction um, management consultant to primarily work with the shelters because they don't do development projects as often to help them um, keep things moving. And then we also have a couple of our staff assigned to going around the state and doing check-ins and helping people do problem solving. Um, there may be, but there are, there are roadblocks that have already come up. For instance, we had one project um, that uh, in Rutland County that had um, not believed it was subject to Act 250 after the project was funded. A, a jurisdictional opinion was, was issued that said it was subject to Act 250. That could have really slowed down the process. Um, people across state government um, kind of jumped into action in a really remarkable turnaround, you know, with the support of Chair Snelling and um, information from the Agency of Natural Resources. The District Commission actually issued the permit within two days, um, and now it's in a, um, a public comment period. So if nobody, if nobody objects within the next week or so, then that project will proceed. If somebody does, it's going to make it really challenging to meet the December 30th deadline. In another instance, there was a project funded um, with, um, for securing a property to provide transitional housing for the homeless uh, and some environmental hazards have been discovered on the site. So that's something they're gonna need to work through. So I share all this in the sense that um, it's really extraordinary that all these projects came forward and were um, really um, um, happy to be able to report to you that nearly the full um, $32 million is committed to projects. And then we have another, um, you know, actually more than the remaining 2 million in applications coming in, but there, but some projects may fall away and others may appear. So it's kind of a fluid situation. Um, I guess I would just overall say, it seems pretty clear that we're gonna be able to use the full amount of funding. We can go on, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the nudge there, Ron. <laughs> um, so here are some examples of what, of what has been funded. Um, so we are gonna be able to secure and rehab housing um, for Vermonters experiencing homelessness. It's in 17 different communities around the state. 212 new apartments and emergency beds in the areas of greatest need. That's the part that's gonna increase capacity. And then also improvements to 13 homeless shelters that are all over the state. Um, and together right now they provide, they provide 250, 51 beds. And we will, um, they've gotten grants to do things like um, um, add a bathroom, add cleaner um, surfaces that are easier to clean, no touch faucets, different kinds of security, you know, no touch security um, uh, entryways and that sort of thing. So, um, and there's a variety of types of housing that's gonna be done um, in a couple instances where there are vacancies in mobile home parks we could quickly get new modular homes and get them sited. Um, you'll see this picture here in Rutland. That's one of three buildings in downtown or in a neighborhood near the center of Rutland uh, that really needs rehab um, and work in order to bring it back um, uh, up to code. And then to be, um, there'll be a total, I believe of nine or 10 units there. In Bennington, this is a property that's actually already owned by an affordable, um, by Shires Housing. Um, but there are a number of units there that, that uh, needed capital investment 
in order to uh, be able to rent them. They're not, they're vacant now and they, they needed work before they could be brought back online. So those are the types um, of, of projects that are happening. There are also three or four motels that will be purchased around the state um, that will be um, um, transformed into micro units or um, used um, as a shelter for domestic um, and sexual violence, people fleeing that. Okay, we can move on. So as I kind of referenced before, and as, as I, I, I think as you well know, but just to sort of uh, reorient us, this is just one, this is one piece of the overall response. So um, you kind of took two, two approaches when you funded all these housing programs, which is actually getting some national attention. We've been written up in sort of national housing groups. Um, or Vermont has the national housing groups information as having a, um, a really comprehensive program. So with um, the mortgage assistance and the rental assistance, you're really trying to prevent future homelessness. Um, and then with supported by legal aid and the Vermont Landlords Association, and then you're addressing the homelessness that was already there um, through the support through the Agency of Human Services for some service money. And then uh, the funding through VHCB to help create units where they're needed in order for people to transition to permanent housing. All this takes a, a, um, an extraordinary amount of collaboration and we have been so grateful for strong support from AHS and the Vermont State Housing Authority. So there's that coordination that's happening at the state level around um, securing rental assistance and support services where they're available to uh, match them up with these new units. And there's also an incredible amount of work and collaboration going on at the local level between the affordable housing developers, the shelter providers and the social service agencies um, in order to create the partnerships there that are going to um, allow the coordinated entry system to identify people who are home, um, the people that are on their list um, and then get them into these units and match them up with services. And even saying it that way is, makes it sound a lot easier than, they is, than it is because the different services and rental subsidy have different requirements and you've got to figure out which ones can go together and um, um, what areas they can serve and, and then um, what uh, service um, capacity is available as well as what are the, um, the program requirements about what kind of services can be um, can be offered. And so all those are being um, braided together. Okay, and um, the Good Samaritan Haven in Barrie is one of the shelters that's gonna be doing, a, um, doing some work to um, become COVID compliant. Okay, we can move on. So I wanted to just take a minute and then um, just to say, um, but there's other good work that's happening. The CRF funding, $32 million is a lot of money and an incredible responsibility. And we are very grateful for, the, for that and for the work that all our partners are doing on the field, um, out in the field to, to, um, to get the to work. It's a very specific kind of housing for a very specific purpose. And it's in part made necessary by the lack, underlying lack of affordable housing. So I wanted to let you know that progress is still happening on that front. Um, in large part, thanks to your support. So um, construction paused when everything shut down, um, and but now it's back um, up and um, for the most part, I mean, it's kind of been a gradual process, uh, but construction has resumed on projects that have been funded um, with the housing revenue bond and other, um, including some from Josh's program and, and Morris um, tax credit. So, Almost 240 units will be completed or online soon all over the state. And these are just a few examples of them. So in St. Albans, um, there will be 63 new units in the building that you see here and another one around the corner. That's a collaboration between Champlain Housing Trust and a private developer. Um, uh, construct, uh, Snyder Construction is doing that work and this, um, uh, the person in the bottom corner is actually um, working on, that's a photo from that site. Um, in Virgins, the, they just had an open house. Well, not really an open house. They, they have the ability, um, they actually showed the apartment. It's about, it's almost done. So they showed their apartment. People who, residents were gonna move in were able to see their apartments recently. And I'm, I'm, we got a report that they were just, uh, they were brought to tears. They were so excited about it. And they're single moms, um, they're seniors, 
Um, there are people who have um, some physical disabilities are going to be able to use the ADA units there. And then there are a number of house working households that um, for whom this is the, um, a good affordable option for them. And there's, I believe there's going to be a, um, a ribbon cutting on September 25th. And then up in the Northeast Kingdom, the project at the bottom is just finishing up in Lindenville. So, uh, and then we've talked to you a few times before about um, the Cornerstone Project in St. John's Bury New Avenue Apartments and that the construction is underway there and um, apparently there's great excitement in the community about that. Um, but I want to let you know that this regular work is going on and it still needs to happen. Um, and also to make the point that uh, you've heard from the state auditor and others and from us and Housing Vermont and others before that um, housing construction has one of the best economic multipliers and um, can be one of the best way to help jumpstart an economy. So it's, and we hope to be able to continue to do this and continue to fund, um, fund more housing construction. Let's see, so we can go on to the next slide, Ron. And so I can kind of bring it to a close here. Um, the photo on the left is uh, from Rutland and um, Hussam and Zahar al Ahalik Mansour moved into their family this summer. This is an example of the um, single family or the home ownership work um, that you've made possible through VHCB. This one was built by Habitat from Humanity and a grant from VHCB lowers the overall cost to the family. This is a little, this is my way of segueing to saying that um, providing for affordable housing in communities is one of the most important things and the best ways you can do to make them more inclusive and um, welcoming and I'm really, i um, grateful that your committee is spending a good amount of time on S237. I think that's um, really important work and um, I, hope that, I hope that that can advance. So I think to close is that um, at this point, Mr. Chair, you sort of, um, there are no tweaks to the legislation or um, the pieces that authorize VHCB that we would ask for. Um, I, honestly, the biggest single change that would help us would be a change in that federal deadline of December 30th. And um, we know that that's out of your hands, although we've been in touch with Senator Leahy's office and we'll continue to, um, to pee in touch to let them know um, what the implications of that are for us. There are a few other projects that we um, would have been able to fund if not for that, um, for that deadline. And it um, has created, a, you know, perhaps the biggest disappointment for us so far in this in this um, in the rollout of this is that uh, because of the deadline and other circumstances um, nonprofit developers in the upper valley and in central Vermont weren't able to get a deal together in time to bring something forward to us so um, I believe those conversations those efforts may still continue just in case there's a chance to advance those in the future um, we were able to help shelters in each of those areas, but there's not, um, there, we don't have a project in front of us that we're able to fund um, around creating new units in, um, in those two areas. And those are, those are high needs areas. Um, so we would have- Oh, short, short. Oh, sorry. No, questions. I was just gonna, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, am I fading in and out again? No, you're there. I would just, Gus is here and I don't know if he has anything um, he'd like to add. We would just appreciate this opportunity to stay in touch around how the applications are coming in and how that looks compared to the funding available. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 no, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. I, guess I would just add, and I think Jen probably covered this, a real hats off to the State Housing Authority the Burlington Housing Authority and the Rutland Housing Authority, all of whom are bringing rental assistance to a number of these projects, um, along with uh, the Agency of Human Services, and they're bringing a fair amount of service dollars as well. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say is whether within the CRF timeframes or not, there will be partnerships that are developed and projects developed because of the discussions that took place over this summer between housing providers and homeless service providers. There is, for instance, an old school in Barrie owned by the local housing authority, but and eventually that'll get turned into housing 
as a partnership, but it would never have met the December 30th deadline to be ready. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that you'll see more of this good work continue um, despite the deadlines. Right, one more thing I, I'm yep. sorry, Mr. Chair, one more thing I forgot to say is, um, well, to thank this committee for its steady support of our, um, our base appropriation, which is, which is really important and appreciated you listening in um, earlier this week as um, the committee's um, looking at a potential what the governor's recommended as a 3% reduction in our property transfer tax appropriation from last year. We have indicated to the committee that we can manage that because of what's been added in the capital bill for this particular fiscal year. Um, but what that means for us is that um, we may need to look to some of the CRF funds for um, um, maybe from a half to one and a half percent of that to cover some administrative costs that um, due to that due to that reduction. We had um, hoped to be able to use all of it for grants, which is what we did with the housing revenue bond, but we just kind of wanted to let you know that that's a possibility um, and to hear from you if that's a concern at all. Okay, thank you. Um, I have two questions, um, but I also want to be mindful of the time. It's 1016 on my computer. Um, we still have to hear from Maura. If um, people can stay till 1045, I'd like to extend today's session so that we can hear about the foreclosure because um, there's a couple of, not only just an update from the foreclosure, but there's a couple of key elements that we may have to um, pay attention to. I think it was alluded to earlier where people were um, uh, paying their mortgages, but then couldn't pay their taxes and there was a tax sale issue. So um, let me just get to the two questions. Uh, Representative Triano and then Walls. Um, yes, um, thank you, Jen. Um, I'm just curious now, uh, back in March, um, Jim Levinsky from Memorial Housing Partnership indicated he had five lots um, at a renovated mobile home park uh, in Hardwick and um, that he could quickly uh, fill those lots with um, five-star energy homes, which uh, were 13 units were converted about three or four years ago. Um, and um, it, the park just turned the park completely around. So he said he had five new spots that he could uh, put uh, affordable uh, five-star energy homes on. I was just wondering if there was any contact with him or if there's any funds left to try and do something like that. Um. They, LHP did not apply, Representative Troiano. Um, I'm happy to reach out to Jim to see if that's still a possibility, but he has not mentioned that. Um, so I'm happy to reach out. But the answer to the question of, of is there funding available is it would probably take an increase in funding to do that. And I'll reach out to him today and let you know next week if, if there's some possibility of doing that. That is exactly what we're doing both in Bradford and Bristol is filling some park vacancies with um, modular housing that's highly energy efficient. That's why I asked. I am in contact with Jim right now um, and uh, we, we're going to have a sit down. So uh, if you reached out to him, Gus, that'd be great and we could continue the conversation between he and I. Thank you. Representative Walls. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, places like the Good Samaritan Haven and Barry uh, uh, undergoing revisions so it can be COVID compliant. And I think that's gonna be true of other congregate models. Uh, that's gonna result in a loss of bed. So my concern is what can we do to either maintain uh, the current or the pre-COVID number of beds or even increase them? What are we doing to do that? So we've made a grant to the Good Samaritan Haven, um, what we call a project related capacity grant. And we actually did this uh, with state dollars pre-COVID um, right after Rick DeAngelis became the executive director um, for them to look at real estate options throughout central Vermont because even pre-COVID, I think we all thought representative walls that the facility was inadequate and right. overcrowded. And so that work is underway. It was a great disappointment. There was a lot of discussion with the owners of a motel in uh, Barrytown and fair amount of discussion with the College of Fine Arts um, about 
purchasing or leasing facilities from them. And both of those negotiations were not successful. So we will keep working with Rick to look for the right piece of real estate that can better meet the needs of central Vermont. Uh, so it's still a big gap uh, for us. Um, to that That's a to huge address. concern. This is not a good time to be losing beds. So thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you, Gus and Jen. Um, Maura, can I get you finally online? Yes, I am here, thank you. My name is Maura Collins. I'm the director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency and I'll give you a um, brief update of the mortgage assistance program um, that you all authorized with $5 million of the CRF funding. I'm hoping um, that Ron would pull up the first page of the um, testimony that's on your website. You've seen um, our August 10th report, um, which was due to the state and, and you all have a copy of that. I had asked him to just pull up the first page because um, I am hoping that he could just scroll down just through this one page so that you could be reading while I'm talking about some of the, these are excerpts from our applications, which were the reasons why people needed the mortgage assistance program that um, was provided. And you'll see here as he scrolls a little bit that um, you know, a lot of people had good jobs um, and you know, but for COVID wouldn't have needed assistance. I'm seeing phrases like it's humiliating and humbling. These are a lot of people who um, are in situations where they were furloughed, they became unemployed, um, some of them may not be going back to work for another year until this crisis fully resolves. And um, this program has been critical for them. And, and so I just wanted to start by thanking you for selecting VHFA to um, administer this program. This is exactly what our mission is to do, to serve the housing needs of the state for low and moderate income Vermonters. And um, so it has been, um, a heartbreaking joy to participate in this program and, and get VHFA staff working um, directly with folks in this way. So you can see um, the rest of that document Ron is scrolling through um, on your committee website. I'm gonna walk through it a bit out of order um, because I'm gonna start with the good stuff which is what we've done with the money and then I'm gonna jump back if we have time to tell you a little bit about the program design. Um, thank you, Ron. And um, I, uh, some of the numbers I'm going to be sharing with you are a little different than you'll see in the report, but that's because I submitted that report August 10th and it's now the 28th and I wanted to give you the most up to date numbers. Um, so uh, we've had, we've processed over 280 applications. Most of the homeowners owe about $1,200 a month as a monthly mortgage liability. A third of our applicants are five months delinquent on their mortgage, and another 25% are either six or more months delinquent. So if we're, we're processing the applications now, and if we were to fully fund every application we've gotten, which like Richard said, we're still just kind of double checking that all the numbers are right and line up with that the loan servicer um, agrees with the numbers that the person applied for originally. But if we were to fund everything, we'd use about 1.8 million of the 5 million appropriated in direct program costs. As you've heard many times, um, the need for this program we do think will grow. Um, through July, people had the benefit of the pandemic unemployment assistance. There was the stimulus check that came out. And um, so we are, I'm anxiously awaiting what the first 10 days of September do, because I wonder if um, a bunch of people uh, maybe were not able to make their August and September mortgage payments. And as of September, they would then be eligible for the program because we do have an eligibility threshold that you have to be two months delinquent in your mortgage in order to be eligible. We didn't wanna create a moral hazard um, problem where um, people you know, were maybe only uh, one month delinquent. We wanted there to be a little time. 
The need, um, as I said, I do think will grow. Uh, we just got numbers this week from a survey of the Mortgage Bankers Association, where just in Vermont, we saw that the number of mortgages that are more than 60 days delinquent has doubled to 6%. And um, so we're seeing more and more mortgages uh, go into higher levels of delinquency. That said, the actions of the um, federal government and the foreclosure moratorium for the state um, have been helpful in keeping people housed. And we know that two thirds of our applicants do have a forbearance agreement. It means that their lender, whether because it's a Fannie or Freddie owned mortgage, or there was some kind of mortgage insurance by the government like FHA or rural development, they had some kind of um, program that required that they be offered a forbearance agreement. Uh, other lenders may not um, be required to offer that, but may just, require, um, may just offer it to borrowers anyway. And that forbearance agreement lets people skip a couple mortgage payments. So that sounds great. I mean, in many ways, I think there's a question of how much is this program needed when someone has a forbearance agreement and their lender has told them that they could skip three, four, five months of payments. The problem that we see, and if you remember what you all grappled with in this committee and over on the Senate Housing Committee was what happens when that forbearance agreement nears the end. And what typically happens, whether it be six or 12 months of forbearance that's been granted, is that that loan gets modified and the lender near the end of the, the expiration of that agreement will turn to the borrower and say, all right, let's talk about how you can pay us back for those missed payments. And for the next couple of years, the mortgage payment will increase dramatically to pay back those missed payments. Uh, that can really push people, especially since our program is designed to serve low-income Vermonters, that can really push people into the risk of losing their home and unaffordable housing. To get to some of the demographics, um, to speak to Representative Gonzalez's question earlier, um, we did work with VSHA uh, DHCD and Vermont Legal Aid, and we all agreed that we would ask the same demographic questions. Um, and we've been tracking it, and I'm really excited that so far our applicants have been younger, more racially diverse, with larger households, and are more likely to be disabled than the general population. So we're doing some things um, intentionally through our outreach um, to, to target those populations. We have agreements with the five homeownership centers, as well as AALV and the Vermont Center for Independent Living, where we work with those nonprofits. We had special Zoom trainings with them to explain to them all the details of the programs. And we've asked them to be ambassadors to help people, their constituencies to apply for the program. They, many of them are offering up um, computer kiosks in their um, offices. They're assisting people with applications. They're helping us with a lot of outreach. And then we're reimbursing those nonprofits and a nominal amount um, for every application that they help people submit. Um, to the demographic question, uh, we do ask a gender question, which is male, female, or non-binary. Uh, and we don't ask about sexual orientation, nor do the other, um, does VSHA, I believe, because again, we had agreed on asking the same questions. We had played around with that question, as well as veteran status and a couple others as options of trying to get better, deeper demographic information. But um, we decided to limit it to the ones I mentioned, uh, or I haven't mentioned yet, ethnicity, race, gender, disability, and household size because we really were trying to balance our need for information with our need to have short, succinct, quick, get the money out type applications. So that's where we landed with that. You can see in the report that's on your website or you could go to VHFA's website and get live reports that get updated every week with the demographics of who's been served in the program. You can see how many applications by county we receive, and we've compared that to the state, the number of state homeowners with mortgages. I'll tell you that we're serving slightly higher than expected uh, folks in Chittenden, Lamoille, and Wyndham counties, 
and we're a little low in Rutland and the Northeast Kingdom. So we've been um, talking with the homeownership centers in those regions about how to um, get more applications from those areas. And Richard talked about some of the additional marketing that um, we may be working on in the future with VSHA to get the word out about this program. Um, for the program design in statute, you all asked that we set an income limit based on a percentage of area median income. We did that. And we also, again, to get to a real simplified program that we could um, move quickly and have be easily understood, we didn't want a complicated income chart. And so we went with one um, income limit <clears throat> for most of the state of Vermont with a second one for just for Chittenden County. And in both cases, we were able to pick income limits that uh, roughly translate to about 80% of the area median income. We are only looking though at their most recent 90 days of income because you could earn a really good income last year, but if you were furloughed and didn't have any income or were in unemployment for the last couple months, that's what we wanna judge your need based on and not what you earned a year and a half ago. So um, we've asked for uh, just the last 90 days. Um, I'm, we thought that demand for this program was going to be much higher than it has been. And again, I wanna point to not only the, um, uh, the pandemic unemployment assistance that probably benefited this, but also the fact that um, a lot of folks um, are, have been essential workers um, and uh, maybe on more fixed incomes. And so maybe we're not impacted to the extent I thought they were gonna be. When I was looking at the number of uh, mortgaged Vermonters who fell within our income limits, I thought we'd see many more applications than we have. As a result, we did not go with the first come first serve approach. We wanted a batch approach. We thought that that was more equitable for those who may not have great internet connections or um, with language access barriers or things like that. So we started taking applications uh, July 13th and we said we'd take them until August 31st, which by the way, we're gonna keep it open longer because we have money left. But at first we thought let's keep it open for that month and a half, take in the applications and we would prioritize those who were at greatest risk of foreclosure meaning those who did not have a forbearance agreement because they would probably be up first for any kind of foreclosure action and those of the lowest income. Um, we also originally, the statute said that we could give six months of mortgage assistance. Um, and we started saying, we'll give you three months and very quickly after seeing the applications being at the level that they were, we said, okay, we'll do up to the six months that statute allows. Um, so uh, we pay the money um, directly to the mortgage servicer. Um, and we think that uh, that ensures that the use goes, it goes to its intended use, which is paying down the mortgage. Um, and by accepting even a partial payment of what a mortgage holder owes, if they accept that payment, then they are required if they've already been in a foreclosure process from maybe um, last year or something like that, it, it resets the clock and it restarts everything if they accept a payment like that. And so that has been helpful in com combination with the foreclosure moratorium that you all passed um, by statute uh, in order to keep people housed. Um, so, uh, Another way that we expanded the program, you heard a little bit about already. Uh, if a mortgage holder, it, um, it, usually a mortgage consists of your principal and interest, as well as maybe escrowed taxes and escrowed insurance payments. Those last two taxes and insurance, homeowners can decide if they wanna escrow into one mortgage payment or if they wanna pay those separately. And everyone makes an individualized decision based on their circumstances. What we realized was that for those people who had escrowed their taxes, which is the common thing that we see with this population, um, then if we're paying six months of their monthly mortgage liability, as you put in statute, then those taxes could be covered by this program. But there were circumstances, and there was one in central Vermont that caught our attention, um, especially where someone 
uh, has a mortgage payment, but didn't escrow their taxes, did the right thing by staying current on their mortgage so they didn't lose their home, but now we're facing a tax sale because they'd fallen behind on their property taxes. And so kudos to the state. We turned to Josh. He immediately was an advocate for this. And I think it was within 48 hours, we had a decision from their consultants guide star and um, support from the state <laughs> to expand the program in this way so that now if you have a mortgage, but you're not escrowing your property taxes, uh, we can pay up to six months of those back property taxes. And we were able to, um, uh, work through the Home Ownership Center with this one person in central Vermont to actually stop a tax sale that was due to have happened yesterday. Um, so that has raised a question about um, should we expand the program again? And for this, we need a statute change. And I pose this as a question to you. I posed this to the Senate Housing Committee as well. And I'll tell you what where they landed, but um, I wanna make sure you have the same opportunity. The way the statute reads, we are limited that we can pay a household up to six months of their monthly mortgage liability. There has been a question now that we've expanded the program with this um, being able to pay back taxes, should we also look to be able to pay back property taxes if someone does not have a mortgage? They may be facing a tax sale in the same way, but they don't have a mortgage. So right now, we can't help them because six months of their monthly mortgage liability, six times zero is zero. Um, I, I'm asking, do you want to change the statute to say six months of the monthly mortgage liability or the annual property taxes if it was going to lead to a tax sale and, and loss of the home? The Senate reception was lukewarm. They saw some need. Uh, they were worried about, you know, as I said, I think that demand's going to grow. I think that even in the next 10 days, we're going to have more applications coming in, like I said, from the folks who now are delinquent from August and September mortgage payments. Um, and so without increased resources, you are, you know, taking this pie and, and slicing it more thinly. Um, at the same time, one senator was raising the idea that since there is property tax relief through our income sensitivity program. Maybe this is a topic that that committee should take up in looking at income sensitivity a little differently this year. And instead of looking at last year's income, maybe there's a way to do something similar to our program where you look at a smaller window of income, like what was your income over you know, a 90 day period in the year? Or you know, did you have a unexpected COVID related loss of income? So there was a question of not just helping um, people eligible for this program who fall into the uh, income eligibility, but maybe this should be something that um, gets handled more broadly through the income sensitivity program. I pose the question to you all um, in terms of, you know, we're here to administer a program that you've designed and for you all to consider. The last thing I wanna say before I stop and hear you, um, is just, I know it is absolutely important and, and responsible for us all to be looking differently at outreach and access uh, in light of the social events that are going on right now. We have a light being shined on uh, inequitable access to programs. And this has been a focus throughout the implementation of our program. So I talked about the demographic questions that we asked. We also translated um, an application guide into the nine languages that AALV recommended to us. Um, and uh, we put those application guides in those nine languages on our website. And as of last week, 75 of those application guides have been downloaded. So considering we've helped 280 applicants already, and there were 75 application downloads in um, different languages other than English, um, that tells me that this is an important thing that we need to continue to push for um, across different types of programs. We spoke of the nonprofit partnerships that we've done, um, and we've worked with Legal Services of Vermont um, and others in partnership to um, push this program. So I think that wraps up. Oh, Representative Stevens, you had asked Richard um, about future reports. 
Um, again, we have a website set up that we refresh every week based on the applications that we've received. So we can you can watch online um, what is happening both with demographics and demand for the program. Our next official written reports, according to our contract, is September 25th to the state, and then kind of a concluding one, uh, December 15th. But I'm happy to engage with you all. We're doing everything very automated and, and computer-based, so um, report reporting is not a huge burden for us. I do want to just make clear that when I speak of um, having probably spending about 1.8 million in direct program costs at this point, we have not begun to cut checks to servicers. We have the luxury, as opposed to Richard, who's dealing with landlords who are um, individual small businesses usually who haven't collected rent in many months and they're really hurting themselves by not paying their mortgages. Uh, in the lending world, um, it's not unusual for things to take a little longer. We're working with investors and servicers. So of the applications we've received in July and August, we anticipate that we always plan that the month of September, we would be processing those and working with the servicers to get ready to cut those checks and that those checks would be cut by the end of September um, and include September's missed mortgage payment so that people are fully um, paid for as long as they are delinquent. And if a homeowner uh, has not used up their full six months at that point, they will be getting a notification that says, we have made a payment on behalf of let's say four or five months, but you may be eligible for six, and we're gonna create a process that they could come back for those last payments if they still have a need and are still eligible. Happy to answer questions. Um, I've got one in the queue from Representative Triano. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you, Mark, good to see you again. Um, in the, on the issue of forbearance, um, it, it, isn't there a possibility that rather than um, increase monthly payments once this emergency order is off, that these payments are tacked on to the end of the mortgage at the same rate? Uh, is, there, is that a possibility? It absolutely is a possibility, but that is not a guarantee. And depending on how long someone has on their mortgage, it actually may not be that likely. If you can imagine that that mortgage is actually owned by an investor and you're dealing with the servicer who processes the payment. So um, if, the, if there's a forbearance agreement and uh, I have 20 some odd years left on my mortgage, I'm essentially providing an interest-free loan for 20 some odd years for that amount that wasn't paid because it's not gonna be collected um, for that time period. And so there is a cost to investors for that. And therefore, um, it, it's not always the typical way that this gets done. If that was the norm, if that was um, the, the requirement, then I think I, I'd feel a little differently about this. But I mean, wouldn't, that, wouldn't those payments um, generate um, interest throughout the, the 20 years that they, they're owed? Well, again, you have to have a loan modification um, to accommodate for that. Uh, it, there, there is math to that to um, calculate what that interest would be and, and how long that would have to be extended. And so that's why it always leads to a loan modification at some point. And, and just uh, one other thing is on the property taxes, I think that uh, the income sensitivity would be uh, quite inadequate in, um, in, in, in uh, um, helping with um, back property taxes. I mean, when I go around and speak to people in our in my district, um, you know, a, a fairly modest home, and especially um, uh, in in my district, um, uh, school taxes have gone up um, exponentially. And uh, so we're talking about people, you know, with modest homes o o owing five, four, three, four thousand dollars a year in property taxes, and it, it doesn't seem. Uh, adequate to me to be able to um, distribute some of that money through income sensitivity. It just doesn't have the capabilities, even if it were to be modified to a lower income, um, mm -hmm. which would generate a, a larger uh, uh, um, rebate. But mm -hmm. I don't see it happening that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to end the conversation now. This was um, we have...
many of the numbers on uh, in our on our website in our documents for the for the day. Um, I'd like to thank Richard and Gus, Jen, um, Josh, and Maura for filling us in. I think there's um, as we've had discussions, as I've had discussions with them throughout the, the summer, it's clear that we're just now approaching a very, what could be a difficult time. I mean, while I'm glad that the uptake was not as much as we expected it to be, I think that there's, this is the next wave of um, possibilities. One of the things I heard locally, um, which was, which I probably only lends to it just to a small degree was um, our local good neighbor fund helped a bunch of people with their back rent as well. Probably not dozens, but certainly, um, you know, within our community, there was a number of people who were receiving money locally and not tapping this program. So I wonder if, if that's part of it. Um, but I think that the, the rental rearage program, especially the way Richard discussed some of the older back rents really speaks to some more chronic problems. But um, I, I, I think we're ha we have to gear up for the next couple of months, um, next three months anyway, at least to see how uh, we come out of this period where people have less income through the, through the UI program anyway. But um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, thank you committee. We will, um, Ron will get out an agenda pretty soon over what the next week will be. We'll be focusing a lot on S-237, also on H-739, and, um, and working on um, the housing issues as they come forward. So thank you, have a good weekend, um, and we'll see you Tuesday.